everybody? Is this, is this working? Can you guys hear me? Yeah. Okay, we're going to get started. I just wanted to say a few things, let's say, to situate where we are in the series. Uh, this is the last uh, kind of official single-person lecture of the semester. We will have two more events after this on November 1st and November 6th, each of which will be made of two guests speaking uh, for a shorter time period, followed by a conversation that I will moderate on the topic of mediums. It's a format that we've introduced this year that we're just calling SOA Conversations, and something that we hope to repeat uh, next semester with a different topic. Um, so please come to those last two events, uh, and I'm going to leave it to Abingo to introduce our guest speaker for the night. Thank you, Kyle. Can you hear me? Yeah? OK. Um, tonight, uh, thank you for coming. It's, and it's a great honor to introduce Jay here. Jay is an architect and urbanist whose work is dedicated to the invention of the city. He founded his Manhattan-based practice studio V Architecture in 2006. Under his direction as owner and sole principal, the studio has grown to over two dozens of architects. Jay personally directs designs and guides philosophical approaches across the studio work focus on the overlap of architecture, urban design, and innovative preservation. Jay was born and raised in Buffalo, very close to here. Um, the post-industrial landscape of the abandoned great elevators and the aging steel miles in which his father worked make a big impression to him. First at Cornell University and then Harvard GST, he uh, observed the ethos that the design of architecture and making of city are a continuum of interlocking issues where contemporary architecture and innovative urbanism must thrive together. Jay went to London on a Fulbright Fellowship, which allowed him both independent inquiry and professional work. Some of Jay's most notable work to date um, post inspiration from this early experience, including the transformation of forgotten industrial tracks into imaginative civic spaces, the adaptive reuse of historic structures into compelling contemporary environments, and a deep commitment to creating resilient regeneration along abandoned waterfronts. Jay's work seeks to create personal experience, delights, and repose while doing the important urban scale work of reclaiming and repairing the city's forgotten edges. The result is a body of timely, impactful, and enduring projects to address larger issues confronting city building. His studio's work is redefining the waterfronts and urban edges of New York City, but Jay's focus on the reinvention of the city has led him to create award-winning designs from central Spain to remote islands in Japan and to the plains of Siberia. Jay has published extensively both in mainstream and professional medias and recognized by numerous honors, including AIA, um, Architizer, Progressive Architecture, um, Masterworks, UL, um, UI, ULI Design of Excellence Awards, and etc. Jay is committed to giving back to design leadership, including doing a lot of innovative community park design work. He's appointed by the mayor as solo architect to help write New York City 10-year waterfront plan. He is dedicated to participants in academia, juries, and public panels, so he was here this afternoon and then uh, joined the studio review. In his free time, Jane is completing his first book, Last Wood Top Here, focusing on reinterpretation of early American architecture, including the Rust Belt of Western New York, as a radical wood topping experiment combining architecture, industry, and urban urbanism that may inform the ways we invent our city today. Um, as we all know, Syracuse City is a famous Rust Belt, so we can't wait to listen and learn from Jay. Thank you, and welcome, Jay. Can you guys hear the mic okay? Is that all right? Abingo, thank you very, very much. And Kyle, thank you very much. And to all the faculty here, I feel really honored and the dean for asking me to speak. Um, sometimes I talk a little bit about the definition of architecture. It was interesting. I met with a group of students earlier today, and we were talking about the practice of architecture. And I think it's so hard to actually define architecture. And so sometimes I fall back on one definition uh, that 
credits by the French philosopher Roland Barthes, where he says, architecture is the expression of a utopia and the instrument of a convenience. And I'm going to come back to that, the idea of the expression of a utopia and the instrument of a convenience, those two things together, because my practice and my talk today and the book that I'm writing are going to address how I think architecture comes from both of those, not one alone, but from both. So first of all, uh, as Abingo said, I was born in Buffalo, and Buffalo had a big formative influence on me. My mother was an English teacher, my father worked in the steel mills, and he took me to the grain elevators of Buffalo, which were a great inspiration, and of course they were one of the inspirations for all of contemporary architecture. When Mendelssohn visited them, Le Corbusier, many, many of the great architects visited them. But this was where my father worked. And he took me there after it was taken down to the blast furnaces. And I got to experience firsthand what it meant to grow up in a city that was changing, where technology left it behind, where it, in a sense, destroyed the architecture. And some of the most important architecture there that really defined the city actually also led to its downfall. And it took a long time to come back from that. And I'm going to return to this as a theme in my work that has to do with how do we reinvent a contemporary city and how do we do it by facing our past? How do we do it by integrating these kind of artifacts into it and also embracing a contemporary architecture that grew out of these artifacts? How can we blend those two things together? An innovative urbanism and an architecture that actually will lead that the city. So after I lived in New York, uh, after I lived in London, I arrived in New York. And one of the things that impresses me as I started to look at the city and begin to understand it was this was the 19th century, Olmsted who really helped transform the city through this great central park in the middle. This was the 20th century. It had to do with Olmsted's actual sons, who actually developed part of it, and Robert Moses, who had made other interventions and transformations of the city. But the 21st century, I believe, in New York City, belongs to this, the leftover spaces, the gaps, the interstices, the places between the East River is almost the new central park of New York, where this is becoming the center for affordable housing, for parks, for ferry networks, these leftover gaps in industrial edges have suddenly become very important in my work. So I'm going to show you just a few samples of my work, but I'm going to really focus on three projects. So the early ones I'm just going to go through very, very quickly to show you the relationship to old and new, or the way we use inspiration and design to lead to final solutions. The first project, Yonkers. Yonkers Raceway had this amazing 19th century canopy all made of wood. I was asked by Tim Rudy Sr. to create a new building for them at the raceway. And this building had been torn down and I thought it was tragic. And he asked me to create a completely contemporary building. So I started with the idea that we would adapt that and reinterpret that canopy in something entirely new. This is a steel lattice shell structure covered with ETFB foil, a very contemporary material. And this new canopy that I tried to make every bit as wondrous as the original 19th century wooden canopy became our inspiration for how we would do it. It grows up out of the hillside. This was known as the hillside ice track. I could create a kind of an illuminated surface. I could set it against the backdrop of the curved glass. So I wanted to use contemporary materials to create something as wondrous as that original canopy was in the 19th century. Next project. I had a client in New York City, and he was taking the wood from water towers. Now, water towers in New York City are still made by two old Italian families. And it's only two of them that still make them. They're all made out of this beautiful redwood or cedar. But when it's gone, they throw it away. So I had a client actually burn it and contribute you know, to global warming. So I said, what if we took the elements of that, the wood that's left over from the water towers, and we make pavilions? So this is a diagram showing the original pavilion, which has these kind of horizontal straps. These are the vertical elements. And I said, what if I could take that same amount of wood and make it into a pavilion and put it in parks? And what if it's something that's so simple high school students could put it together except it could only be done today because it requires a computer in order to figure it out, where we could create these simple molds. I could use the same metal straps, and then I could turn this into a pavilion and place it in New York City parks and reuse that wood and find a purpose for it. So this is Moby, another project. Next. Urbanism is all about different uses. And a question for me is how you can combine radical different uses within a single building. So I was hired by the Durst organization to do a building for them on 58th Street, they wanted to do retail, they wanted to put in a hospital, a hospital for special surgery, and then they wanted to combine three different types of housing, social housing, market rate housing, and a new type of co-living. So in this project, we combined five different uses, three residential uses, plus retail, plus a hospital, all within a single building on 58th Street and 11th Avenue. We articulated the different uses, 
so the retail could be more open and glassy. The hospital could have fritted windows for privacy and optimum floor plates. The residential would set back to allow light in on all four sides. The client is very interested in high levels of sustainability. And then we created a series of public spaces and the kind of gaps and interstices between the buildings. We created a new public street that went through. We created a series of roof gardens. We filled them with artworks, working with local artists in order to develop the different components and bring life to the public spaces and the gaps between the different program elements. Next. A client came to me, he was an unusual guy, his name was Fabrizio Ferri. He's a famous fashion photographer. I was telling some of the people earlier, I don't quite know how we get our jobs. I can't remember how Fabrizio found me. Very, very interesting guy. He photographs the cover of Vogue magazine. For years, he was, uh, he lived with Isabella Rossellini, the famous actress. Now he's married to Alessandro Ferri, the famous uh, ballerina. And Fabrizio called me and he said, I bought this boat. And I need to make a building because I'm going to lose my lease in downtown Manhattan on Tribeca where I have my photographic studios. It's called Industria. And so I would like to take this boat, which was a former floating hospital. It's really a barge. It's not a full boat. It can be moved around. It was decommissioned after it provided health services for the poor of New York City. And he said, I want to make it into a floating art center because no one's using this boat right now. And then I want to moor it off of New York City. So we worked with him to create a series of shell-like structures that could cover the boat. And then we developed this idea that parts of it could be daylight studios and parts of it could be dark studios. So you could do photography within the studios within the base and you could do other elements that required daylight, <coughs> artwork, exhibitions, stories, performances in the upper level spaces. Next, Macy's. We never did a retail project and I didn't really know that much about retail. And then somehow we got a call from Macy's and they wanted to talk to us about renovating their store in Manhattan. They have their iconic store on Herald Square, uh, which is a, you know, one of the most famous stores, I guess, in the world. It's been there for 109 years. Now they had renovated the building hundreds and hundreds of times. The buildings were built between 1892 and 1938. They really went the gamut from original uh, Beaux-Arts pavilion classicism up to early New York modernity. When I got to the building, the windows were largely filled in. The interior was cut off from the exterior. Huge areas had been sort of infilled to the point like arteriosclerosis, where there were layers and layers and layers on every ceiling, on every wall. Part of it was just to strip it away. The energy systems were terrible. The building was highly inefficient. So we were hired to do the first full renovation of the building in 109 years. We started at the ground floor where I said, what if you could just open back up this great hypostyle hall of the original <coughs> entryway to Macy's, the grand ground floor, and we'll create, which was a historical mezzanine around the perimeter, and open that up, and that will fund the rest of the development, as well as significant new energy upgrades and building systems. So this is the space, and one of the things we did was, it actually triggered a whole debate about preservation. And I'm very interested in preservation, which I'm gonna talk about a little bit later. But the idea here was that there was this whole Art Deco interior, and the only problem was it was from 1988. And so we tore out every element of the fake historical elements, and every element that was truly historical, the facade, the windows, the original spaces, we kept them, and as well as brought back the larger open nature of the ground floor. But basically, we took all the true history and perfectly preserved that and brought that back. And we took all the fake history and stripped it away. We ended up having a series of articles in the New York Times where people told us we were taking out the history of Macy's, and our point of view was we were putting it back. Everything that's of our time should look like it's of our time, and everything that was truly historic, we should restore back into what it was. Then we took certain other elements. This is the restaurant on the sixth floor where we did unusual fabrication techniques. This, for example, is one of the longest bars in New York that's made out of marble and stainless steel that flows together. This was a former stock room that was entirely enclosed. We do a lot of urban work. This is a project on the Queens waterfront. There's a couple studios, I think, right now happening on the Queens waterfront. This area is called Hallett's Point. And this used to be the main entry point to Astoria. The original entry was here, and this was Main Street. You can see the street is almost empty now, but this was originally where Astoria began. However, in the 1960s, Robert Moses tore out most of this neighborhood and tried to do something that perhaps he thought was going to be built social housing here, but it's completely isolated separated from its context, a kind of a cruciform tower within the park scheme, almost a complete failure. This is one of the largest social housing complexes in New York. Now, this is also important to me as I worked on this. My wife grew up 
She emigrated from Hong Kong, and she grew up in social housing until the day I married her. So she grew up in a complex like this. So I thought, how can I work with these people to address this? How can we do the right kind of thing? What should we do with something like this? And I worked with the city and a series of developers for almost seven years. We ended up doing five projects for five different developers, all of whom hated each other, and none of them got along, but somehow we worked with all of them, plus the city. We ended up doing a large development here called Hallett's Point, which is being done now by the Durst Organization, one of the most sustainable developers in New York. We did infill within the NYCHA property, where I worked directly with the president of the Tenant Association, an African-American woman named Claudia Coger, who was amazing and very supportive of the whole project, where we created a whole new series of parks, as well as about 500 units of affordable housing, in, in addition to market rate housing. We put streets back through it. We put a series of stores. We put a bank in there, because there was no bank where people could actually just keep their money instead of going to check cashing places. And so this is what we developed. We brought in Jim Corner Field Operations to help us design a series of waterfront parks. The entire site flooded four feet during Sandy. We elevated the whole site with a series of townhouse-type developments built into the base. We created these riparian gardens along the edges so that these areas could flood. And then the water would come up and these areas would all be protected. And now this project is underway. It will probably take about 10 years to build out, where there'll be about 2,500 units of housing. There'll be 500 units of affordable housing. There'll be three new parks. And we also designed and put places for three new schools in the neighborhood, including an elementary school and a high school and a nursery school. A different project. This is a restaurant. Uh, Masaharu Morimoto is known to many people as the Iron Chef. He's a famous Japanese chef. He's actually a really terrific guy. I thought when I would work with Morimoto, like what's it gonna be like to work with a world famous celebrity chef? Will he be very difficult? He was an amazing person to work with. He asked us to help him design a restaurant. There was a space that was an older industrial building. It had 37 foot high ceilings. So it was very, very high. So we decided to create this continuous bar that would wrap through the whole space and tie all the different levels together within the restaurant. This is the completed restaurant. The bar is made of a combination of Corian and Microlite. We worked directly with one of our 20-something-year-old designers in order to do all the modeling, of course, in Rhino and using Grasshopper in order to manipulate the points and feeding that directly to fabricators who made it out of Microlite, which is like the material that's used to make the shells of boats. We created a series of open spaces that wrapped around, and we created these light fixtures, which are made of Japanese copper fish traps wrapped with dichroplast beads. This is the exterior where we took the old industrial building. We opened it up with new hurricane-proof windows. The project is in Florida. In order to open up the exterior to the interior, and then took Morimoto's favorite sayings in Japanese and had a calligrapher make them and laser cut them into the corrugated zinc facade. This is the Bronx Post Office. The Bronx Post Office is an unusual building. It was built in 1938 by Thomas Harlan Ellett, but we decided to create a series of interventions inside it, including this polycarbonate addition on the roof. This project is being finished this month. It's under construction right now on the Grand Concourse on 149th Street. This is the interior lobby. The lobby had been run by the post office for years, so it was purchased by a private developer because it was no longer needed as a postal sorting facility. We're now turning it into a community college, retail and restaurants, this area is a food desert, and business incubator startups, which is an important thing for the Bronx, very important for what's happening there, and the borough president was very supportive. These original murals were by Ben and Bernarda Sean, a very famous uh, muralist, really modern muralist, and so we've completely restored those. The post office had unfortunately almost ruined them by covering them with varnish, and so for the last 50 years, they've been black and almost impossible to see. And we've restored all those, and they will be open to the public, because the landmark lobby will permanently remain public. The rest of the post office was sealed off. It was a secure uh, facility. Now it's all going to be accessible to the public as it opens out to the Grand Concourse. This was the loading dock, which is now going to be the entrance to the business incubator. We wanted to keep each aspect of it and even celebrate the history of this. I like the kind of industrial character of the loading dock as the new entry. This is a private residence. We don't do many of them. But I was very interested in the notion of verticality in New York City. So in this particular case, uh, it's an addition on top of an 1869 old original landmarked hotel. The hotel was very interesting. Oscar Wilde had stayed there. Mark Twain had stayed there. So I wanted to celebrate verticality, created a 27-foot high library 
that actually goes through and connects the different spaces as well as a series of gardens on different levels. So this is a staircase built into a fireplace that leads up. It reveals the different layers of the building from 1869, the wood is Civil War era, just after. The steel is from around the Great Depression, 1929, and then the rest of it is of our time. Creating interpenetration between inside and outside, and then a series of gardens. This is a small project, just the renovation of an interior, where we were asked to just take a canopy and reclad it in an existing building. We decided to do something unusual. We wanted to experiment with fabrication with a coil wood, where we stacked it and milled it to create this completely interactive canopy that would go from exterior to interior and turn into a bench and an interior desk and to use this as, a, as an experiment in fabrication. We used all sustainable oils to coat it. And the koya wood's really unusual. It's just natural pine that's been infused with the vinegar from uh, the process that's used to make sugar. And it makes it impervious to water. And then it creates these beautiful kind of moire type patterns. Industry City. We worked with them to do a master plan for this six million square foot space in New York City, the largest private industrial complex in America. These are these buildings, but they're no longer used for light manufacturing. We did a master plan that's completely transforming it to bring it into the heart of the maker industry. We started by bringing small restaurants and cafes and livening it with a series of gardens. We put artist studios into it in order to start to bring life to it. And now MakerBot has relocated here a series of food concerns, a distillery, a brewery, a company that makes drones. This is now at the forefront of the New York maker economy, but part of it was all about creating social spaces that would make those people want to be here and connect them together and celebrate the history of the building. We also did the simple renovation of the facades, which from a technical point of view is the largest window restoration job in New York City, replacing 15,000 windows. So when I come back to that sort of expression or idea of a utopia, the expression of a convenience. To me, everything from knowing how to replace the windows and restore the thought to the sound to create a series of social spaces with a garden, this is what architecture is. It's somehow between the two. Somehow we have to combine both of them. So I wanted to show you this, which is the people I work with. And what's important to me is really the way we make it a studio. And so it's important when I show you these projects, I get to speak to them. And I can't tell you about all the people who worked on them. But really, we work together as a studio. We play together. We run together. It's very, very important to me that even the fact that we call it a studio, I've decided not to name my firm Belgora Architects. It's really a studio, and the studio comes first. And when you think about the atmosphere that you have in school in a studio environment, that's what I strive very much to do in a professional environment. That's very, very important to me. So then I'm just going to touch on a few larger topics. So this is a little bit what my book is about. I'm going to show you three projects in a little bit more detail. So one of the things I became interested in as I started to look at early American architecture was how we started to create a series of radical inventions that started to reinvent cities. This one might not be on your radar. This is Oliver Evans, who created this beautiful idea of an automated mill. However, when he did that, one thing you may not be aware of is that mills became the origins of many of the American cities. So it's funny, in Europe, historically, Lewis Mumford tells us that cities were founded by a citadel and a shrine. Basically, it was the purpose of having a church or a castle to protect us that founded cities. But in America, that wasn't the case. We created these machines in the middle of the wilderness. And the first thing built in all of these cities was a mill which generated places and food and created jobs, and that actually generated cities in America to the point where it expanded to a tremendous degree. So the mill is one of the first ideas in my American utopia that how we transpose the machine into the garden to generate cities. The second one is closer to here, the Erie Canal. The Erie Canal I consider to be a 340 mile long piece of architecture, which also generated a huge number of cities, including the city we're in today, which I know suffers from how that canal has changed over time. Some of the things were amazing. This, of course, is Clinton Square when the canal went right through the center of it and helped make the city grow up almost overnight within a 20-year period when we were doing cities at a tremendous scale, and even doing things like having rivers cross other rivers, for example. This is one of the famous aqueducts. So the themes of transposing levels, artificial levels, and instant cities through the way we deployed machinery within the landscape is another theme of the American utopia, where this, I believe, should really be thought of as one 340 mile long piece of architecture that actually generated 32 cities. The grain elevators I spoke to earlier, 
The grain elevators are really interesting to me. Joseph Gart, who invented the grain elevator, actually took Oliver Evans' invention of the automated mill and applied it vertically. The grain elevator predates the regular elevator that led to vertical architecture. The elevator led to elevation and the notion of vertical architecture because there just wasn't enough room at the lake in order to get the grain out through the lakes and up into the buildings. And so they created this idea of elevated buildings. The elevators are also interesting that they were used to elevate themselves. They actually used the elevators to build themselves automatically as a vertical architecture. So the elevators for me are a huge inspiration. Instant cities. The Chautauqua Institute was the idea of creating an almost instant city where a group of people that were actually religious in nature decided to create temporary cities where they could educate people, not only in religion, but also in books and reading and literature and philosophy. And they created these temporary cities that were astonishing in their breadth, were used for education and for uplifting people. Expositions were the same thing, including the American Exposition in Buffalo, the Pan American Exposition, which was astonishing for being the first to use electric power where they transformed the entire thing because of the relevant power in Niagara Falls, where they created this ephemeral vision of what a future city could be. Olmsted's Park Network was critical, the first one in Buffalo, in terms of creating a whole series of links that would tie together all the different elements of a park. So here's the problem with each of these utopian elements. So Oliver Evans Mill, in addition to creating all the great cities in America, led to the dark satanic mills led to the invention, actually, through Henry Ford of the automobile and the destruction of cities. The Erie Canal, today we know, is gone. Syracuse and other cities like that have taken a step back. This is an image of the Love Canal, which was one of the last elements that was defined as an originally utopian experiment based on the whole canal mania, which, of course, was an environmental tragedy. The grain elevators, despite their huge success today, are largely empty are gigantic ruins. We don't know what to do with them. Olmsted's Park Network, the first complete park network in the world in Buffalo, this is what's happened to it today. They took that original park network and they ran the Skijakwata Highway right through it. This is actually how they transformed the first park network in the world. It became one of the early highway networks and destroyed it. The Chautauqua Institute, the idea of an instant city, one of our biggest challenges today is that we're creating cities at an unprecedented <coughs> scale. We've built more in the last 50 years than we've built in the last 5,000 years. The idea of an instant city today perhaps holds more terror than promise. How can we create cities at this scale today that will have meaning? The Pan American Exposition, for all of its fanfare, was devastating in terms of its failure to really have a long and meaningful impact. So I would ask the question, what can we learn from these kind of radical utopian experiments, many of which came from upstate New York, western New York? What do they mean for us today? So now I'll try to point a few ways with three particular projects where we're experimenting with some of these former edges, some of these industrial ruins, some of the detritus of cities. This to me, I think, is something that offers the opportunity for us, so I show you three quick projects. Maker Park. This is a site in Greenport, Brooklyn. It's the old Bayside Oil Works. It's a whole series of oil tanks. There are 10 of them. And they have a kind of a beauty, but they're all so terrible. And they have these beautiful open spaces. They have fantastic views of the skyline. They overlook Manhattan. They have these incredible shapes. Each one is two layers, an inner layer and an outer layer. The oil is all gone now. The site is polluted. And they're trying to decide what to do with it. By the way, these two women, are they here? Two women, I thought I had a photograph of them, actually came together and came up with a vision. Let's see. Oh, I thought I had a picture of them in one of these. Two women, Stacy Anderson and Karen Zabarski, came forward with a vision for it. Now, this is the neighborhood. This is the area in Greenpoint. It's a very interesting area. It's a very complex neighborhood. But over the years, New York evolved like this, where they were just building pure towers. And so there was this conflict within the neighborhood where there was this cool character and small shops. And at the same point, the city was building towers and some affordable housing. And they're saying, what could we do in order to keep the character of this neighborhood? How could we do things that are different? So Stacy and Karen did some research, and they started to work on this. Now, also, this area was designated by the city for a park. 
but the city couldn't deliver on it because they unfortunately designated it as a park, but they didn't own it, and they failed to buy it. And then as all those towers started to happen, they didn't know what to do because the value of the land went up so tremendously that it actually prevented them from buying the land to provide the park that they promised for the neighborhood. And so for 10 years, there was community activity that said, like, where's our park? How can we put our park here? So this is Bushwick Inlet Park in New York City. So here they are. So Stacy and Karen came in, and they're local Brooklyn residents, and they said, well, we have a vision for the park, and we'd like to do something. So they gave a talk at the Municipal Arts Society, which is a nonprofit group in New York, and I was giving a talk on equity in the waterfront, talking about that project I was doing at Hallett's Point. And they came up and they said, we want to turn these oil tanks, we want to keep some sense of the history of the place, and we wonder if you would help us. And so I volunteered to help them and do the project pro bono. So first, we started to document the tanks, which are quite beautiful, and the spaces between them. And we thought that these had a lot of promise. We thought there was something kind of special in these. And then we looked at the history of the site, and the history of the site was surprising. So we found that it was originally, it had been in oil works for a long time, but the oil works that it was was called the Astral Oil Works. And it was actually a very early American industrial experiment where one of the early people came in, and his name was Joseph Pratt. And it turned out that Joseph Pratt actually uh, founded the Astro Oil Works. He actually was a fairly early American uh, kind of utopian industrialist. He did early social housing for his workers. He tried to pay a fair wage. And he founded, he sold this site to a guy named John D. Rockefeller who was desperate to buy it, who was trying to create a corner on the world oil market, which he did. And he used the money to found the Pratt Institute. And the Pratt Institute was very, very unusual. It again held up to Pratt's early ideals. It admitted women, it admitted people of color, was extremely unusual for an institution of its time. And by the way, it was one of the original maker institutions, very, very progressive, where it tried to teach both the practical arts as well as inspirational philosophy. So this was the history behind this site. So how could we create something that would be worthy of that? So here are the 10 oil tanks. There are three types. There are three different sizes. And so we started to think, how could we create something that would be worthy also of this amazing neighborhood in Greenpoint in Brooklyn? And so this was our vision for it, where we would actually keep the tanks, we would remove the lids, instead of digging out the whole site, which we did calculations would take about three years, would take 30,000 truckloads and cost about $200 million. And instead, working with Ken Smith, a famous landscape architect who we also brought in, we would stack earth around it and plant plants and bioremediate the site, injecting bacteria into the soil and remediate it that way, and create a series of gardens that would both protect people from the site, as well as capture and tell the story of the history of these oil tanks, and not try to erase all the history on the waterfront and replace it just with towers, or replace it just with lawns, but to do something that would actually tell the history of what had happened here, and reinterpret it in a new way. These are images of the tanks, and here's how we propose to change them, and we wouldn't even control all of them. We'd create a, seri a series of changing gardens. Some of them would be full of water. Some would be full of groves of trees. Some would stay enclosed and be a performance space with a rooftop space. Some of them would have kind of amphitheaters within. And so we started to develop these, and some of them might even change over time. Some of them might be temporary installations where we wouldn't try to design the whole thing, but create a showcase for constant change. Hanging gardens, wildflowers, trees. So this is one vision where we turned it into a picnic grove filled with trees and wildflowers. Here's another one where we fill it with water and create reflections onto all the sides and have boats. Here's another one where we create an adventure playground. I remember one of the people came up to me in the community meeting and he said, sir, do you tell me you want to put children in these oil tanks? Do you think that's right? And I said, excuse me, but do you have children? And he said, no, I don't have kids. And I said, well, I raised two kids in the city. They went to public schools. They played in public playgrounds. And they would be the first to go in here. They don't want to sit on the lawn. They would absolutely climb inside these oil tanks. They would be the first ones here. Now, we came up with one last idea. There is a project in New York called the Billion Oyster Project. I don't know if any of you have ever heard of it. But in New York City, they're working to try to recreate life in the harbor. And it turns out that New York City's harbor, the estuary, used to contain half of the oyster population of the world. It's one of the most unique microclimates in the world. But right now, the harbor is mostly dead. So there's a guy named Pete Malinowski who is working to try to get a billion oysters back into the harbor. Now, Pete is an oyster farmer from Long Island. He, his dad, farmed oysters. 
And he's basically come up with a theory that if you get about a billion oysters going, that that will create a sustainable environment where they'll become self-sustaining because they need their shells in order to reproduce. And most of the shells are gone now after so many years. So we thought, what if we took one of our tanks and no longer used it to hold petroleum? What if we used it to grow oysters? So we came up with the idea that one tank with each of the shells would tell the story. So we begin with the oyster evolution and the Lenapes who used to harvest them sustainably and how the Europeans came and how they destroyed it and how we ended up ruining our riverfronts and environments. And then we would tell the story of the Billion Oyster Project and how they're actually reclaiming it because they're taking all of the oyster shells from the New York restaurants, they're bringing them in and putting them in tanks and collecting them, they have to cure them first. Then they put spat on them, which are the embryonic oysters. But the thing is when you put them into a tank, one of the problems with oysters is that normally they give millions of eggs and sperm, but they have to find each other across the harbor, so the fertilization rate is incredibly low. But if you put them in one tank and bring it up to ambient temperature, well, it turns out that you get almost 100% fertilization and you can do millions of oysters all at once. So Pete has been working with school children to do 10,000 oysters at a time, but we said, what if you could do a million oysters at a time, five million oysters at a time? And so we're developing one of the tanks, and to me an inspiration, of course, is Boulé, where I love things like this with the pure geometries, the cenotaph of Newton. And so this was a bit of an inspiration. So we said, what if we could create a mechanism in one of the tanks that had a spiraling walkway up, because we want to bring school children up to the top so they can look down into the tank safely and see where the oysters are being made. We'd have to create a crane in the middle in order to lift the gabions out that hold the shells and we could actually tell the story of the oysters by having a spiraling sequence that takes you up to the top where you can look into the tank and then back down again and then to the water. And then this is Bushwick Inlet, which it turns out is one of the best oyster environments on the entire East River because the inlet is almost like a giant womb through which we can impregnate the entire harbor again with the oysters in order to start to bring back the ecology. So this is our idea for the Billion Oyster Project. And this is our idea for Maker Park in the tank. So we include other things, because we did want to include some great big lawns. We did want to create some athletic fields. We wanted to create all the different components, and we created this dunescape on the exterior. And now our team is working closely with the city in order to try to bring this vision into a reality. <coughs> Next is Empire Stores. So a different example of trying to approach that idea of utopia, but to do it through how can we create something realistic? How can we create something that's meaningful? This is an interesting story of a series of coffee warehouses. So the entire Brooklyn waterfront was composed of a series of warehouses, and these were magnificent coffee warehouses that were built from about 1861 to about 1869. In their day, there were these huge buildings, and these sit right next to the Brooklyn Bridge. So these are very, very prevalent, and these giant arches. But today, they look like this. Today, they're almost empty and abandoned. And the day I showed up in New York City 20 years ago, I saw, I walked down here, I didn't know the buildings, and I was at a party in the neighborhood, and I walked down and there was a car on fire in front of us. This is what we've transformed that to. So this is a project we've just finished in the last year, and it was a competition with the city. We felt very honored to participate in it. A lot of great architects participated in it. We felt very lucky to win it. And so we created this whole series of spaces that are commercial and that all the spaces in here pay for and support the programming of Brooklyn Bridge Park. Now, the original warehouses formed almost a line, and it was known as Fortress Brooklyn. It was actually kind of like a Chinese wall that separated the dangerous working waterfront from the community. So our first idea was to actually create a cut through the middle of the building in order to open it up. Now, a big inspiration for me, I happen to like the artist Gordon Matta Clark. And I love the way he creates slices in buildings, openings, reveals them. This is his famous project in Paris, which is near where the Centre Pompidou site is. And so we said, and this is a very unconventional preservation strategy, what if I make a hole through the middle of this landmark protected building? And part of my thinking was that I didn't want to cut off the building from the outside. I didn't want to just repurpose it into commercial spaces. I didn't want to make that private spaces, I wanted to create a public sequence that would lead through the building and take you to the park and reconnect the community to the park. And this was our idea in the competition. And to my astonishment, it won. So this is the space today where we created a public courtyard that brings light and air into the center of these coffee warehouses that had never been made for human habitation. They had never been sealed off. They had never had windows. And we worked through all of these details. The other inspiration for me 
when I go back to school was I was really interested in Vincent Scully when he talked about the invention of contemporary space. And he always referred to this, the Carcieri, the drawings by Paranese of these diagonal spaces looking up through these series of bridges and staircases. And I said, what if we could make this space like that, where we create a spiraling sequence that leads you up to a public park on the roof? And we would create something that would entice you to go up so you would get this sequence where you would go around the whole building and reveal each of the different elements of the making of the building, such as these magnificent schist walls from 1869. And that would create the sequence that would lead us up to the rooftop park. And so that's what we did. We cut the hole in the building, and then we created this modern addition on top, which also helped pay for it, and cut through the courtyard here. Now, one of the challenges with this building also is that it exists right in the floodplain. So we also have to deal with issues like this. This is an image during Sandy when five feet of water came into the building. So we also developed an innovative system called an aqua fence that completely surrounds the building and protects it. So now the building is restored. We worked carefully to keep the age of the original building and not clean it up too much. We created this opening and cut through into the courtyard beyond where you get the sense of deeper space. This sequence leads you up through the building in a spiral up to the roof and reveals each of the different tenants. And it has a waterfront museum on this side, public restaurants and cafes, and then private businesses that all support the park, but they're all accessible and viewable from the public spaces. And this is the sequence that leads you up through it, where you go back into the depths of the building and then back out again towards the facade. And then it finally culminates in the top, and you get these views into the surrounding offices where we also restored the interiors. Again, I didn't want these just to be private spaces, but I wanted you to be able to look into them and see them and understand the building. And then finally, it leads you up to this rooftop park. And this is the finished sequence, as you can see it, where it brings you up above the skyline. One of the things I'm kind of excited about with the design is every time I go there, People are constantly Instagramming it. People are constantly doing events there. There are children playing on the roof. There are people getting married in front of it all the time. So to me, one of the greatest privileges is designing a public space that people are really using. The last project I show you tonight is one that I haven't shown in public before, and it's very much in progress, although I'm kind of excited about it. This is Silo City. Now, Silo City are those original grain elevators I showed you that I went to go visit with my father. And when I was talking at different conventions and an AIA convention, I met a woman, and I would always go on about the grain elevators, and I would talk about how amazing these were. And she's like, have you met my brother, Rick? And I'm like, no. And she said, well, he owns most of them. <laughs> so I said, I'd really like to meet Rick. <laughs> so I went out and met Rick, and it's pretty interesting. And he, in fact, does own everything I'm showing you here. And it turns out that Rick was a third generation guy who had a metal business. His grandfather founded it. He was one of the first people to get into this newfangled thing called stainless steel. He thought it was going to be big someday. He founded a company called Rigidized Metals. Rick's father continued that. And Rick was kind of a gadfly. He ran off. He wanted to do music. He was sort of bohemian. But he came back and he took over the family business because somebody had to. And it turned out he was really bright, and he started to work with young architects. He has an affiliation with the University of Buffalo. He started to do parametric modeling with all of his metal systems. And he started to create these really innovative things, like his grandfather did, using metal in creative ways. But along the way, he needed to get access to the waterfront right here. And this grain elevator was owned by a huge ConAgra Canadian International Agricultural Conglomerate. And he called them up and said, I'd just like an easement past your grain elevator so I can get to the river because I need to ship some metal out. And the next day, the head of the company flew out to meet him and said, I'd like to sell you this grain elevator for $50,000. <laughs> and Rick bought it. And then he tried, in an ill-fated plan, to redevelop it for ethanol production, which probably wasn't the best idea, but he did. And he managed to get some of them working again. And then he hired this unusual character named Jim Watson, who's a fantastic sort of savant engineer. Jim lives on the site now. He's sort of the caretaker. And he knows more about the site than anybody. He got one of them operating again, but it almost bankrupted him. And he changed his course of action and decided that he wanted to create something very different. What if he did a grassroots kind of arts and cultural space? And what if he could find a few people to partner with him and maybe create some housing, maybe some artist housing, some other things? And so Rick started a plan for this. And so this was our latest project where we decided to work pro bono for Rick as a research experiment and to start to work on this. So these are the spaces. Now, a lot of it is dangerous and inaccessible. Swanee Jim takes us up through the whole thing. You've got to be very, very careful going through it. 
but some of the spaces are open and cleaned up, and there are two types of buildings. Some of them are like this, where they're mill buildings, and these are highly suitable for adaptive reuse. These are perfect for things like housing and business and incubators. Other spaces are the elevators. This is the base of one of the elevators. These are not so suitable for adaptive reuse, or they have to be something special, because we don't want to just puncture windows in them. We don't want to just open them up or tear them apart. So I think there's a dichotomy between the mill buildings, which are half of them, and the warehouse buildings, and the elevators. And so there are two different types. You know, Rainer Bannon used to talk about the mill buildings are the grid, and the elevators are the pure sculptural Corbusian volumes, and the two of them need different treatments. So these are the spaces. So first, it was crazy. Now, by the way, I don't know if he's here tonight, but Ife worked with us and actually helped us document a whole bunch of these. He's a Syracuse student. He's a thesis student. And he worked on this as well as many, many other people. And we had to document all of the buildings. We had to go back into Swanee Jim's shack and find the old original drawings of them. We had to digitize them. We had to create rhino models. And then we developed a program. I'm also working with Future Green on this. David Sider volunteered to do the landscape. So again, we worked with a lot of people even on research type projects. And now we've started to develop a plan and a program for the entire thing. But part of it is that it's going to develop very slowly and organically over time. So one of the bigger ideas is I go back to that Olmstead Parks network. So now these are all the Olmstead Parks and Silo City is right in the middle and we want to create a green series of parks and open spaces that connect the different buildings together and tie back into the original Olmstead Parks network. And these are going to link through it and follow the original rails which were owned by CN Rail. And many of them pass right through the buildings and are going to create green passages that actually go through and connect them and create a continuous waterfront path around the whole edge. So there will be a public sequence that unites the whole complex. Then each of the different components, we came up with a program. The smaller little individual buildings are going to be a hotel, restaurants, bars, cafes. Rick opened the first bar this summer. The Perot complex, again, the dichotomy, we're going to turn the elevator itself into performance spaces and art spaces, but the mill, we're going to turn into workspaces, co-working spaces, as well as some residential. The lake and rail, a huge complex wrapping around. The building here, which is the original administration building, will become housing and offices, but the rest of this will be dedicated entirely to art and to art halls. It's one of the largest complexes of all the grain elevators. The Marine A, all of them have these fantastic names, will be dedicated solely for art, but we are going to do some housing up on the roof. So again, we'll never penetrate the elevators, but we will do additions up on top. And then finally, the American Mill, and this one I'm excited about, will be the first phase. There are two elevator buildings, the elevator and the elevator annex, which are going to be made into an art space and an auditorium, a giant swimming pool. And the mill buildings were going to turn into artist housing and housing. Some of it will be market rates, some of it will be social housing. And now, this has turned into a real project where a developer has come forward, Generation Development, and they're working with Rick and they're working with us. And we're now engaging on the design of the first part, what's gone from really just a pro bono project, a research project, is now on its way to starting to become a reality. So these are just some of our first images, and these are kind of hot off the boards, where we're showing the idea of creating a series of gardens on the roof, and part of it is just to make the roofs occupiable. One of the first things Rick wants to do is create a series of walkways and bridges that just connect the roofs and allow you to walk safely across the elevators, even before they're fully done, to create green spaces. This shows some of the openings that we hope to make within them, where we'll make no new penetrations to the exterior, but we can open up some of the interior spaces. So this shows the plans for adding the greenery and the roofs to connect it together. There's a series of conveyors and walkways that tie many of the buildings together. This show our preliminary plans for the interior space. So this is the American elevator where we're looking at making one of the first art halls. Again, one of the rooftops that shows actually the existing bridges that tie the different spaces together. Another view of the interior art halls. And this is our view of the natatorium where we hope to actually create a swimming pool because these are still waterproof and we would fill the lower layers and take away some of the upper layers and create a giant swimming hall in one of these on two different levels with a waterfall connecting them. So as I come back in conclusion, and I kind of start, I kind of finish where I began, for me these were a big inspiration. And one of the most enjoyable things today I did was talk to a bunch of your students. And there was a session on practice and they all wanted to ask those practical questions like, what's it like to be in a business? Tell me about your failures. I love that question. What a great question from students. Tell me where you really failed. What did you do? Tell me how you can pursue the kind of work you want. Tell me how you get work. 
Tell me what we can do. What do you look for? I really love talking to your students and the questions they had. And I come back to that first quote I said about searching for a utopia and the expression of a convenience. And the biggest advice I could give to them or that I could conclude with tonight is to say that I think you have to really seek both. You have to look for those original inspirations, just like what I consider to be the radical architectural experiment that happened in Western New York in early American society, that perhaps will lead a way to point to where we go with cities today that are now also growing on an exponential scale. But we also have to learn the practical realities and figure out how we can work with developers, how we can co-opt them to our purposes, how we can still create a vision for the city and achieve that by working with people. And that's very much what we strive to do in my practice. And that's what I wanted to share with you today. Thank you. You guys were very peppy when we talked earlier at the practice session, so I know you guys can ask good questions. Can you say the first part one more time? I guess, um, so the question was, what aspect of the field would frustrate me the most, or what do I think we could do in order to overcome that, right? You know, when you're in school, one of the challenging things is, it's pretty tough in architecture school. You gotta do a lot of work, you gotta learn a lot of things right off the bat. Um, and I think that sometimes there's a little bit of cynicism that comes from working hard, and you need it a little bit, almost in terms of self-protection, in order to get through a very challenging and a really excellent five-year education like you're getting here. So I guess, and many of you, I guess, and there are also MR2s, but you know, a, a very rigorous MR1, so a very rigorous architectural education. So one of the things I would say is that um, part of my frustration would be where I think that people don't realize that architects can still have power to kind of change the story a little bit. You can't always change it. I mean, I'm not naive. I've had projects that have failed. I've had projects where clients have taken it away from us. I've had projects where we didn't fully realize everything we wanted to. So that's part of it, for sure. Um, I loved that question earlier about like what was my most spectacular failure and I was thinking there are so many. How could I people? <laughs> because I could name five or six or ten. But my frustration would be I think that we often lose sight of the fact that we're really taught to be problem solvers. And if there is a way we can kind of turn that on its head where we can try to solve problems for people by coming up with solutions that are so unexpected that they become the things that actually make everyone work together. I think that's where we offer the greatest hope and opportunity. So I guess I would say that one of the challenges we face is figuring out how to use the incredible skills you guys are all learning now and how you can really apply that. And I do think that because of what's happening with cities today, how they're being completely reinvented, reinvested, both American cities as well as many of you are going to go to cities all over the world to return to your countries if you're not from here, which many places are growing and expanding tremendously in terms of cities. How we reinvent cities is going to be huge, and the way we use the complexity of the city as a device in order to create better architecture, I think is one of the biggest opportunities that we have. And I think that's gonna be happening everywhere from Syracuse to China. And many of you may not see it, but I think it's happening in Buffalo right now, and I wouldn't have imagined that maybe five years ago. Yes? So that's a great question. First of all, I realized once my practice was established a little bit, I felt like I wasn't doing enough. And I'm not talking like some altruistic thing like I should just be doing more. Yes, that too. But I felt like I was missing an opportunity to do more creative things. And so as we started to have some success, I started to think that maybe I was missing something because, you know, I felt that um, 
that one could get too drawn into creating just a business. And so I kind of felt the need to challenge myself and step outside that and do some purely creative work. And I found that I could do that with pro bono work. And once we had a little bit of success, I felt like I could put some of that back in and invest in that and pay for that. So that became really important to me. And the second part is somebody like Rick. It's interesting. Sometimes you can't even give it for free. Like when I first met Rick, a lot of people were really interested in the grain elevators. And so I kind of worked with him for a while before I started doing the design. In other words, I didn't just come in and say, hey, I'm redesigning your whole space pro bono. I said, well, why don't I help you? And I started, it took me over a year just to document the site before I designed anything. And just to come to understand the site. And Rick really saw that and he said, now I really do want to work with you. And now I really want you to help make this happen. So it's not just showing up either or even having a good idea. Sometimes you have to work for it, which was the case with him. So I think that, um, I think that the pro bono work is important. And part of my goal, in a selfish way, is I want to realize it. So for example, Maker Park, which we also call the tanks, you know, we did that just as a vision because some community people wanted to do it. And I was proud to do that. And one of the most important things was it wasn't just me, but I got a, a great landscape architect. Ken Smith is one of the most famous landscape architects in the world. I got an environmental lawyer to donate his time. This is like an $800 an hour guy who donated all of his time. I got a public relations firm. I got Suzanne Tillotson, one of the great lighting designers of the world. I got Thornton Tomasetti, one of the best structural engineers. Every single person I asked, not a single person said no. I was kind of shocked by that. I thought a couple of them would say no. Nobody said no. So I think it's not just what I do, but sometimes our skill set is about bringing together people. So we did those designs, but it was also about bringing together the team that could help make that project real. And that project started pro bono, but now we're very quietly working with community groups and with the mayor's office to see if we can make a deal. Yes. So you made a bunch of points. Let me try to break them down a little bit. Um, so Hallett's point, that was the project on the Queen's waterfront. So first was the issue of the complexity, the scale, the time of it, and even the, the size of it. And then second, some issues related to the waterfront or, or how we could bring it about and realize it. So on Hallett's point, um, one of the challenges there, first of all, is we elected to go for height. We elected to do towers, and this was important, but it was the city's policy and city planning's policy that they wanted to encourage density at the waterfront because they felt it was important in order to pay for the huge amount of infrastructure that would be necessary to clean the site and build a series of parks and build a series of roads. But that's a question you could ask. So we ended up doing tall buildings there, 30 to 40 stories. Then second, in order to mitigate that, we actually developed a whole strategy where we would step it down to the waterfront, create townhouse type scales at the waterfront, and do very, very extensive public parks. One of the interesting things is that the people in the community, normally people in communities can be very anti-development. There's sort of a natural human tendency that if you're in a neighborhood, you sort of want it to stay the same. Amazingly, with the leadership and the social housing there, Astoria Houses with Claudia Coger, she really led the whole group of people to support the development because she wanted stores, schools, parks, and she felt that the towers really didn't matter. And as a matter of fact, her own housing development were those sort of cruciform towers within the park. So they were already living in smaller versions of towers, as well as the fact that we made all the connections directly through, that we connected the whole social housing complex to the waterfront. So we cut the buildings into much smaller parcels and created all kinds of openings and connections to the water. So those were key points. Then finally, we had to deal with some of the waterfront issues that we deal with everywhere, which are the sites were polluted and that uh, we had to make them resilient, and we had to find creative ways to actually lift up the whole site four or five feet. That was the first project approved after Sandy, and we actually rewrote the zoning code in order to allow the buildings to be elevated relative to the floodplain, and that's now the law for all the waterfronts in New York, but we were the first to do that project. So sometimes architecture is not just creating images and pretty pictures. Sometimes it's changing the code or regulations and doing things like that that can impact people. Yes?
Gentrification is a tough issue. And as an architect, I tend to believe that building is good, but it's a huge issue in New York City. So let's advance it a little bit more. So first of all, New York City is a pretty progressive place, and it's hard to do things there, but with all the buildings that we do, 25 to 30% of all the buildings that I do on the waterfront are now social housing, and that's in perpetuity. So when we do all these different projects, um, every single one of them now has a mandatory social housing component in addition to extensive public spaces and community facilities. So I tend to believe myself, and not everyone believes this, so I respect that others may have a different point of view, but I believe that to advance social issues, we should build and we should include social components in all of our schemes. And as a matter of fact, I was talking earlier, a lot of times, this is a strange thing to say, this gives us power, we will often suggest those. Developers will now come to me and say, how can I get this project approved? And I'll say, well, I'll design it for you, but we have to add a park and a school and social housing, and then I'll work with you to get it approved. And that's actually become a big part of my practice. So I work back and forth, again, that search for a utopia, an expression of an ideal. It takes somebody with money, and it takes somebody with ideals, and you have to put the two together, and I think that actually gives the architect strength. <coughs> Lastly, Brooklyn Bridge Park. Very complicated, very controversial. And I have a very, I do have a strong opinion on this. So for those who know the controversy, which you're alluding to at Brooklyn Bridge Park, originally it was, um, much of the land was owned by industrial interests. It was all industrial for years, for the years when I first lived in New York. Uh, the state owned a bunch of the land, and Bloomberg, who was a very progressive mayor, uh, previous mayor, bought the whole site and said he wanted to make it into a city park. He took a few of the industrial parcels and said that he would make those into private developments that would pay for the entire park, which cost hundreds of millions of dollars. He did that. There was a lot of controversy in the neighborhood where people said, well, you're taking the park and privatizing it, but I don't believe that's the case. He took all industrial land, and then he took about 10% of that land and said, we'll do development there, which by the way included Empire Stores, and all that development will pay for the park, but that was never park land, it was industrial land, and he just reserved a portion of it, and that built the whole park, and I thought that was an outstanding and provocative example of, of good stewardship and uh, good policy. Uh, the last part is most of the people who did protest it were actually the rich people who lived in Brooklyn Heights, actually. <laughs> yes? Um, most, if not all, of the projects that you showed tonight were uh, is where your office intervened into an existing condition or an existing building. I'm just curious to know if you, if you design in such a way that anticipates that something similar might happen to your projects in 2050 or 100 years. I love this question. Somebody asked me earlier too, like, if you do preservation, yeah, what will the future things be to preserve? Um, you know, I think that the greatest honor we could have as architects is to create something that will make its own magnificent ruins someday and be reinvented. You know, it was Louis Kahn who said, I want to design magnificent ruins. I think that if you design things that are strong and respond to people at a human scale, that are part of the fabric of a city, they will change. And especially with today, with technology the way it is, everything that we're designing is going to continue to change, so it's still necessary to create outstanding form, human scale, elements, greenery. Really, I view buildings more like some of those examples I gave that might seem crazy, like Erie Canal, I view them as vast networks of the landscape, so it's really not for me just about individual form. I love form, like that project Bianca shows you, but I think that it really has to be part of something bigger. It has to be part of more of an urban connection and network, and that's what's going to make it something that somebody else can recycle in the future. That's a great question. So, thank you for the talk. Um, Considering that long-term view on the buildings and buildings and the fact that you often are building along the waterfront, uh, what are some of the ways you see climate change affecting the way we continue to reinvent the city? And maybe, if it's okay, I don't know if there's others, maybe I'll make this the last point because some people might have to go soon. Um, climate change is a fact, obviously. Climate change is a huge part of our city. Some people have asked me, and it was mentioned earlier that I'm helping New York City rewrite their waterfront plan for the next 10 years. I was kind of shocked because I went into this room and I thought, okay, there'll be all the greatest architects of New York and planners. And I went into this room, there were 50 people writing the plan and I was the only architect in there. Uh, Kate Orth was there too. She's the great landscape architect who got the MacArthur grant. So I was glad to see that Kate was on it because we worked with her on projects too. Um, I believe we cannot retreat from the waterfront. I believe the way to address climate change is to build properly. 
I don't see the city abandoning its waterfront, so instead I think we have to correct it. We have to lift it, we have to elevate it, we have to make it more green, we have to <coughs> capture storm water, we have to find ways to protect it, we have to create the infrastructure. So I believe that the future, and again, this is a controversial position, is not to abandon the waterfront, but to design it properly, and I think that's one of the great opportunities of our time, and it's going to be essential to address climate change. So, thank you very much. <laughs>